about to kick off our first talk for this week, and it's going to be delivered by uh, Pietro Jacuda from Cambridge. And Pietro's been uh, heavily involved in the hands-on schools for a number of years, co-directed, um, and has really, you know, been, a, say, a driving force. And uh, a pleasure to have him here this week. He is uh, tag teaming with uh, Dominic Vella. Dominic returned to Oxford, and now we have someone from Cambridge. And uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to have Pietro. And he's going to tell us about his work in biophysics. Yep. Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here now. And um, I'm sorry I missed uh, the previous week. Um, as Mike said, I had arranged with Dominic, who is a collaborator on many projects, um, to, to, to split half-half uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, the, the title you saw is, is Biophysics. I would actually talk to you about one of the projects we have in the lab that uh, addresses a biological problem. But, um, but I would like to, um, to have that as an example of how physicists can address uh, biological things. Um, because you may or may not be interested in the specifics of what I'll tell you today. Um, I would still like you to, to think, OK, as a physical scientist or an engineer or computer scientist, um, at some point you may be challenged or you may be become interested in, uh, in addressing biological problems, or maybe you already are. And, uh, and one has to think, what, what are the good problems that, where, where you can actually contribute um, significantly, as opposed to problems where the, 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 the science just isn't ripe for, for physical scientists to come in? Or um, the other danger is just becoming kind of the technician for some biological or medical uh, <clears throat> operation, which is OK. But if you do that, you have to be aware of what you're doing. Anyway, so having said that, I'll return to some of those things during the talk and, and at the end, and I welcome questions in that sense too, I, I, will, I will focus a little bit on, uh, on one particular area that, that we're dealing with uh, in my group. So, um, so, so I've been at PI um, for about uh, 10 years, and uh, I've managed to build up um, a group of people. These are PhD students and postdocs. Um, uh, so some of them, uh, Nicola and Luigi, have taken part in previous hands-on schools as um, as demonstrators, uh, but this year uh, it's just me from this photograph. Okay, so the the subject that um, that involves uh, about a third of those people in the photograph is understanding um, how these little filaments called motile cilia uh, work, and particularly how they beat. So this is a slowed down movie, and and how they synchronize and uh, making such a nice wave, a traveling wave. So so here. Um, these filaments are about 10 microns long. They're microscopic. Uh, we have these things in our airways, so from the lungs to, to the throat. We have them in the brain. Um, uh, females have them in the fallopian tubes. And they basically cover um, the whole tissue, covering many cells. Um, and they, they push fluid. The, in this case of the traveling wave, they're pushing fluid from the right to the left. Uh, they're also enhancing transport uh, across uh, due to the motion that they're creating. This is all low Reynolds number motion. I'll tell you what that means, but some of you probably know already. So there's no turbulence. Um, and, and basically the question is, the, the, these things, they, they're not communicating electrically, and probably neither are they communicating chemically through calcium. Uh, that what we think they're doing is communicating mechanically. So, so they're like, each one of these has an inbuilt uh, you know, pendulum-like periodic motion, and uh, something in the way that they're, they're coupled um, makes them couple in a way that creates a nice traveling wave. A bit like um, if you want to make an ola or like a Mexican wave, uh, if my talk is very good, you can try to kind of just stand up and, and create a wave. Uh, these cilia are doing something similar by getting a trigger from, from their neighbor, a mechanical trigger in this case. Oh, giving you the plan already. So, so in general, <clears throat> I've moved from being a soft matter person during my PhD. I, 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 I studied physics beforehand without doing very many experiments. And I did an experimental PhD looking at liquid interfaces. And never in my life I thought I would touch biology. I thought it was complicated, that there was too much to learn. I couldn't understand anything. I didn't really think physics could do anything there. But, but, but gradually, over 10 years, I, I now have totally changed this opinion. I think biology is creating really nice data, even without the help of physicists. Biologists do this anyway. Um, and now this data needs explaining, 
And the data is of high enough quality that it, it looks like the type of measurements that um, a physicist or a, a physical scientist more generally would take of materials that are non-living. And therefore, as a consequence, also the kind of thinking and modeling that you can do on this data um, is, is now the type that yeah, um, we're used to in, in materials, for example, or in measuring uh, uh, other non-living things. And, and the beauty is that <clears throat> in physics, particularly, um, many of you are physicists, we're used to uh, both drilling down, being reductionist, but we're also kind of lo looking across scales and, and trying to understand how the rules that apply at one scale can give rise to some collective behavior at a higher scale that isn't really encoded in those rules. It's, it's a completely unexpected, sometimes uh, emergent behavior. And biology is really, is really that. It's working out of equilibrium, close to thermodynamic equilibrium in some sense. It's working with many time scales and many length scales. And it's all about emergent behavior that arises from, from some simpler rules and some simpler interactions that the biologists have now deconstructed. So, so the beauty is that uh, a lot of the detail, the, the, the um, nitty gritty of what molecules do what uh, has been worked out. And yet, that's the point where a traditional biologist, molecular biologist approach gets stuck because this, this link then from that level to understanding a process that involves many of, of these uh, interactions together <coughs> is something that hasn't really been part of biology up to now, whereas it has been part of physics. So, so that's kind of my pitch for why it's a good time for a physicist to, to go into biology. And it's the physics of statistical mechanics, soft matter mechanics generally, uh, but also, from the theory point of view, networks uh, and nonlinear dynamics are, are, are the key ingredients in, uh, in understanding this sort of biology that I've been alluding to. Basically, cell biology, but not just cell biology. That means cell biology is where a lot of people have gone into so far, but the same ideas could equally apply to, to simple ecological networks or, or to, to, to other bits of biology where, again, the data is good and the questions are really kind of have become physics -y questions. Okay, so back to, to my topic today. Um, <clears throat> I told you we're going to deal with these microscopic cilia. They beat at, at a few tens of hertz. And if you, if you calculate the velocity and the time scale, uh, and given the viscosity of the liquids that they're beating in, uh, this bo boils down to a low Reynolds number problem. So Reynolds number is the ratio of um, density, velocity, length scale over viscosity. So if viscosity is big, Reynolds number is low and it means you have no turbulence. And this is a bacterium with, with its flagella. This is, this is actually a different biological uh, structure from, from the cilia that I've showed you, which belong to eukaryotes, not to bacteria. But, but the length is similar, and, and the speed at which they move is similar. Uh, this is just to say that E. coli moving in water, uh, moving its flagella in water, creates a Reynolds number which is very small, 10 to the minus 4, whereas a good swimmer in water is 10 to the 4. For, for this ratio, so there's an eight orders of magnitude difference. And if you want to reconcile that and uh, understand how it, would, how, how it would feel to swim at lower Reynolds number, you would have to go and get kind of a chocolate spread like Nutella and try to swim in it. So that's the environment uh, that uh, something like the bacterium is feeling and also these cilia that are beating uh, are feeling. Basically, they're feeling a very viscous uh, fluid and in the case of cilia in the airways, it's even more complicated. They're feeling the mucus, the kind of disgusting stuff that we cough out when we have a cough. And that's the stuff that the cilia are beating in. In fact, that mucus is a, is a beautiful biological screen to, to pr protect us from dust and from lots of airborne pathogens that get stuck in the mucus. Then that mucus is carried up by the cilia that are my, my object of interest. And mo most of that mucus just gets uh, thrown into our digestive tract. OK, so <clears throat> not, all, not all biological motions are lower in those number. If, if you look at uh, kind of large things, swimming, and also uh, flight, th those are all high Reynolds number problems. I, that, that's, this is not my area of expertise. This is the area of kind of uh, turbulence. It has beautiful questions, but they're very different questions. Whereas little things uh, swimming in, in liquids are, are typically low Reynolds number. So hydrodynamics is, is kind of explained by a kind of momentum balance through this uh, Navier-Stokes equation, which many of you have seen probably in courses. It's, it's a, a, and, and some mathematicians spend their whole lives addressing certain regimes of Navier-Stokes. Uh, 
in, in low Reynolds number, you can simplify this a lot and you can get rid of the nonlinearity parts uh, because basically you, 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 you linearize for, for uh, high viscosity and, and, and low velocity. And what you get is an equation called uh, the Stokes, uh, um, uh, Stokes creep equation where, where, where you still have time dependence of the velocity if you want to. Um, but but the, the right hand side here has been uh, linearized. Um, and w within, within this equation, uh, people have solved, for example, the flow around the sphere that is moving slowly in a fluid uh, already um, almost 100 years ago. So the, the only thing which is relevant about that in, 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 uh, in the context of cilia beating is the fact that um, the drag on a cylinder moving this way, for a, a cylinder of a certain length moving kind of perpendicular to itself, is, is different and a little bit higher than the drag on a cylinder moving uh, along its axis. Um, and this means that if you, if you drag the same cylinder this way and then turn it and go back this way and then turn it and go back that way, you're actually pushing fluid uh, to the left. Uh, and so you're doing a conformation change in the system and, uh, and then a periodic motion and, and this uh, it has broken the symmetry and allows you to push fluid. What you, what you can't do at lower Reynolds number is break the symmetry just by, say, moving a little bit faster and coming back slower, faster and slower. Because this equation is linear, if you, if you just play with velocity and time in this way, you just end up moving the same fluid uh, to the left and to the right, and you haven't pushed anything. Whereas this is a trick that we exploit when swimming, because we're using high Reynolds number um, uh, properties of the flow. OK, so at lower Reynolds number, if you want to generate uh, a, um, a pumping motion or a, or a swimming motion or any sort of uh, net momentum transfer into the fluid, you have to play a game of conformation switching and change your drag uh, coefficient as you, as you go through a periodic motion of, of the pieces of, of the system. That's going to be important in the cilia. The cilia that I showed you already in that video at the very beginning they have a power stroke where they are extended and they push, and then they kind of fold on themselves and go back and have a lower, a lower drag as they're going back, and then a power stroke, recovery stroke. OK, the other thing which people, again, Ozin, who has uh, just followed Stokes uh, in the history of, of, uh, of that, that branch of fluid dynamics, uh, worked out already a long, long time ago is that if you, again, at low Reynolds number where, where the equations are linear, you, you can calculate um, for a point-like object moving through a fluid. I already told you you can calculate the flow field around this, this uh, uh, object, which is point-like, but with a sphere boundary condition. What you can also do is calculate the force that this moving object will put on another, uh, uh, another uh, point-like object somewhere else in the flow. Uh, so this, this is now hydrodynamic interaction. It's the force that a moving object uh, puts onto another object in the, in the, in the fluid. So if you have uh, objects labeled with a N, uh, imagine two objects, for example. If, 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 uh, if, my, um, if my object number one is moving, uh, th there'll be a force um, uh, acting on it, which depends uh, on, on the drag of the fluid, and that simply stokes. So if I want to move my object through the fluid, I, there's a drag that resists me. But now, if I have a second object in the, in the, in the, in the system, and it's also held by a force, my ob object two uh, exert, manages to exert a force on object one. OK, I made a long story, but basically, um, the fluid flow uh, uh, transfers a uh, force between the two objects. <coughs> Um, so this force that the two objects feel, uh, mediated by the flow, decays as uh, one over the distance between the two objects. And again, it depends on the viscosity uh, of the flow. So, so this is a, is a kind of a linear you know, matrix that, in principle, if you have uh, n objects couples each of the n to each other, and <clears throat> this one over distance decay, in physics we would call it a long-range decay. Um, it's, it's a decay that basically means that your, your system of many objects really behaves as a collective many-body system. So it, it's a tensor, and the entries of this tensor are uh, three by three objects. So, so it's a very it's a busy thing to, to fill. But if you have a simplified problem where 
you just have two objects that you're dealing with and you, you just make them move on the axis, then, then this uh, equation here just becomes uh, something much more simpler, which is down here. And now, so the velocity of my object one depends on the force that I'm putting on object one, resisted by the drag of the fluid, and then the force on the second object uh, and the, the, the interaction depending on the, that depends on the distance between the two objects. So, so this is now fairly simple. So this would be, if, if I just had two cilia and they were beating, pushing fluid towards each other, uh, force one and force two, I would imagine, are, are the forces that are inside these cilia and that are coming from the biological molecular motors that consume ATP and, and turn this into, into, into force. Um, and then the, the two objects would actually feel each other uh, also through the fact that they're pushing uh, uh, liquid. Uh, so, so one set of exp so okay. So this this was kind of um, had been um, discussed as a as a, <clears throat> as a theory idea about uh, 15 years ago now, and as a possible mechanism for cilia synchronization. So, so the fact that these cilia existed has been known in physiology for a long time, and and people had started worrying about uh, uh, how these these tissues manage to have th those nice waves that travel for centimeters. So. So, so much, much bigger distances than, than the 10 microns of, of the single filament. So beautiful kind of collective wave. And then, so one, one first set of experiments that, that we started to do uh, about 10 years ago was to, to make a, a simplified model um, of the cilia uh, to just see uh, how far away hydrodynamic synchronization would work when you're in a fluid su such as the, the water or, or slightly more viscous water and in the presence of thermal noise. And we did that by um, working with um, uh, little spherical colloid particles and, and putting them in optical tweezers and uh, using the optical tweezer to generate uh, an oscillating motion of the beads and then putting the beads further and further away and checking at what distance we lost, uh, well, at short distances whether they would synchronize and go together and then over longer distances whether they would lose synchronization. And if we work with spheres, then, then the hydrodynamics is really what Ozin equations uh, give us. And we can even write <coughs> Langevin equations that probably some of you have seen for just the uh, Brownian motion of uh, single spheres. We, we can write that as coupled Langevin equations for, for the Brownian motion of uh, more than, than one sphere, so two or more, uh, sub also uh, uh, held by uh, uh, external forces like the optical trap. So the optical trap is, is a, also optical tweezer is um, a system that costs a little bit more than, than our budget for the typical hands-on experiments, um, but not that much more. So it, it, it requires um, uh, a high magnification objective. And if you want the tweezer to be really precise, it's got to be a high quality one, but, but you can sacrifice a bit if, you, if you're prepared to just uh, kind of want to hold objects. Um, you then need a, a laser. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be super powerful. If you're working with visible lasers, probably 30 milliwatts is enough. Um, <clears throat> but if you're working with biological objects, it's better to work with infrared light. Um, and we work with uh, 1064 nanometers. So, so, so this laser is, is basically passed through a series of telescopic lenses um, so that um, uh, Okay, so that a deflection of the beam that we generate here is transferred to, um, to, to a change of angle at the back focal plane uh, of the objective, which then means it's, it becomes a translation of the focus of the beam uh, when we're in the front focal plane of the objective inside the sample here. So this is how you would, it's one way of how you achieve uh, moving this, this point of focus of the laser beam. And the importance of the point of focus is that uh, when you have this uh, very tightly focused light, um, the, the momentum that the light transfers onto the objects in the liquid is, is in some conditions enough to hold that object at the point of the high focus of light, so, which is why this is called a tweezer. Uh, you can basically shine your light and have a, like a tractor beam from Star Wars uh, holding your object uh, at the point of high light. And this can be used to hold things like uh, single cells. Uh, 
or, or, uh, or uh, individual bacteria, or in these experiments, um, these plastic spheres. The objects have to have a slightly higher refractive index than the liquid around them in order for the refraction of light to, to add up in a way that gives you a um, uh, uh, dropping force. Okay, so you, you end up with quite small forces of the order of uh, a few piconewtons, uh, but these are enough um, to, to be slightly stronger than thermal forces that come from just Brownian motion. So, so you end up holding something, and then the, the thermal fluctuations make this thing typically jiggle in, uh, in, in, the, in the potential uh, that you've created by having this, uh, this trapping light. Okay, so we did, we did a lot of experiments with this, <coughs> building up towards uh, using the system as a, as a mimic of the motor cilia. So this was one of the first experiments. We, in, this, in, the, in this experiment, we just uh, held uh, a number of particles. So in, the, in this picture, there were three. In this experiment, there were four, five, six, seven. Um, and uh, here, the traps are not moving. So we, we just kind of created those three traps and, and put a particle in each one. And then we made videos. And uh, unfortunately, this, this picture here is static. But in the videos, uh, each of those particles just jiggles around, basically exploring the minimum of this potential well, which is created by the, the laser light in, uh, in each of the, of the three positions. And then uh, it, it, we, we could analyze the properties of the fluctuations. Um, so, so, so there's fluctuations of, of each drop in the minimum, and they, 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 they kind of, if you plot the displacement from the minimum, it forms a, a Gaussian. And some, some of you must have done this problem as a physics problem if you just have one potential and, 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 uh, and a particle jiggling about in a liquid in that potential, you end up with a Gaussian of, uh, of displacements. But what's interesting here is that we have, we have more than one, and we can look at the cross correlations of the fluctuations of, of these objects. And if you do that, you, you, you back out that the cross correlations are explained by the Ozine tensor. Basically because if you have one particle suddenly moving, it's creating a flow field from that fluctuation, and the other particles will feel that flow field and be pushed uh, in the same direction. So that gives correlations uh, across, across the fluctuations of the particles. Um, this was particularly interesting in these kind of regular kind of polygon shapes because the Ozine tensor could be uh, diagonalized and we knew exactly what, what should be happening uh, analytically even in the, in the relaxation times of these particles in the trap and in the cross correlations uh, between them. Uh, this is just a formula that says what I just said in words. We then moved to experiments where we started kind of move, moving the, the particles. And the first thing we wanted to prove was, could, can we have a, a set of particles that we move in such a way that they end up pumping fluid? Now, I told you at the beginning that we, at lower Reynolds number, you need to change the drug. You need to, if you have just a cylinder, you will have to rotate that cylinder to, to end up pushing fluid that way, because it's not enough to just move it this way. So how can we do that if we just have spheres? Um, well, uh, Purcell, who, who was uh, one of the leaders in this, this area um, uh, about 50 years ago, I think, maybe a bit more, um, had uh, shown theoretically <coughs> what he called the, um, the scallop theorem. So the fact that if you have a, a, well, a scallop is this shell, and maybe this is a movie that moves. Okay, this is a scallop. Uh, you may or may not, you probably have seen these shells as dead, but this is a real scallop moving. So it opens and closes uh, with this, this, this clam of, of two shells, and, and uh, it, it propels itself by, by jetting, uh, jetting liquids uh, out from the back. <clears throat> so, so this, okay, so Purcell called his, his, uh, his concept the scallop theorem, because he said the scallop should not be able to swim um, if it were a low Reynolds number. And the reason is that it only has uh, one degree of freedom, this, this angle uh, between the two, the two shells. And if you only have one degree of freedom, uh, it's a bit like just my, my, what I was describing as moving left and right. You're going to end up uh, with the fluid flow just reversing itself when you open as opposed to when you close if you're at a low Reynolds number. <coughs> 
th this works because it's jetting and that, that's higher in those number. Okay, so, so what's the minimal uh, amount of degrees of freedom that would enable you to, to pump or swim if you're at a lower in number? Well, you need two degrees of freedom so that you can act on the first degree of freedom where, where the second one is in one condition and then you act on it again when the other one is in a different condition. And then the fact that you have those, those two degrees of freedom to switch your configuration means you can make a, a set of moves that is non that is, is non-symmetric when you, when you turn time around. So, so Purcell sketched uh, this. Uh, <clears throat> so here, the degrees of freedom for him were the angles between these, uh, these three uh, rods. Um, so first, he, if you flip the right-hand rod, you go into this shape, you then flip the left, and then you flip the right. But see, this, this flipping of the right from down to up is occurring where this is in a different uh, configuration from, from this one here. Here it was up, here it's down. So, so there's a different drag uh, when, when this one goes back up. And then finally, the, the left rod goes back up. So you return to this configuration. You can then cycle again. So this can happen again and again over time. And this object will swim, uh, or it will not stay in the same position because it's breaking the, the, time, uh, uh, the, the time direction with its sequence of moves. And we can do something similar with beads. This was uh, <coughs> uh, studied first by um, Najafi and Golestanian, um, I think. Uh, so Ramin Golestanian is now in Oxford, but I think when he did this work, he was uh, uh, in Iran. Um, uh, and certainly Najafi is, Ali Najafi is still in Iran, and there's still a very interesting community working on these problems in, uh, in Iran. Uh, Anyway, so, so what they showed is that uh, this, this idea from Purcell could be realized with uh, spheres by, by, by having three spheres and uh, playing with the distances between sphere 1, 2 and sphere 2, 3. And those are the two degrees of freedom uh, that you need to play the same game uh, that is happening in this uh, sketch here. So I'll show you. So they studied it th uh, theoretically, and, and, and we did it with the optical tweezers. We, it, we, we held uh, three beads. Um, we, um, we move the right-hand bead a little bit to the left. Initially, they are the same distances. We move this one to the left, then we move this one to the right. <coughs> now, all three are uh, a short distance uh, be between each other. And then we move this one back here. So it goes back to this position, but it's doing this move uh, in a condition where this one is close up, whereas here it did this move when this one was far out. And then, uh, then this bead goes back out, and, and we return to this configuration. So this is time, and it cycles and loops, loops over, over itself. So this, this sequence of just uh, four moves done over and over again generates uh, a fluid. Uh, so, so this is like a, a micro pump. And if, the, if this object, so, so this is the only thing we can do with tweezers is generate a pump. But if, this, if these moves were, were created by a little piston holding the beads together, then this object would be a swimmer and you would have like a micro, micro submarine um, a, able to move itself. So this is how it's a quite boring experiment. It, um, th these are the three trapped beads. This one, we're not actively moving. It's just receiving the, the fluid flow from the other two. And <clears throat> we can analyze the position of that mean bead and work out that it's being subject to, to a net force, uh, which is the fluid flow uh, that this micro pump is generating. So I won't tell you the details of how we really analyze that data because it's all a bit kind of too much. So, so that was how at lower end number we, we could play with optical traps and understand how, how fluid is generated. And then that led us uh, to, to the real biological question, which is uh, uh, how do these things uh, synchronize? So, so you, you now have to imagine that each of these cilia in our heads is represented by a bead and that bead is doing a periodic motion, say left and right. And we, we now understand a bit about how uh, a set of those periodic motions can generate a flow. But now we have a separate question, which is how, how does this system actually generate that, that well-defined um, set of moves that we know can, can generate a, a flow? OK, so th there's, there's a simpler biological system, <coughs> which is an algae that lives in many ponds, uh, freshwater ponds, and then it has uh, various uh, companion algae that live in the sea. 
that are much simpler and only have two, uh, um, two uh, motile cilia. So, so in, in these videos, the algae is here. It's barely seen because these are subtraction videos, but there's basically an egg-like object here. It's a, it's a few microns big. It's held by a glass pipette that, again, you can barely see here. So it's not, it, the cell here is not actually moving. What, what's moving are its two, its two uh, 10 micron long uh, appendages. So for most of the time, if you, if you look at this algae swimming or if you hold it and watch it like this, uh, the, the two filaments are moving in phase. It's like, it's like swimming breaststroke. But then sometimes the phase is lost and uh, the two filaments start going in uh, out of phase or, uh, or random phase difference. Uh, so, so this was the work of a colleague uh, of mine in the applied math department, uh, Ray Goldstein. And they published a beautiful paper <coughs> where they showed that this, this loss of synchrony in this algae uh, is biologically relevant because it leads to the algae changing direction. So wh when it swims breaststroke, it goes straight and, and quite fast. And then um, if it wants to go towards food or towards or away from good lighting condition, conditions, it needs to have a way to change direction. And uh, having its cilia lose phase is, 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 uh, is the way it has to, to randomize its direction, choose another direction. So, so the strategy becomes a bit similar to how bacteria can, can go up gradients of food or away from things that they don't want by, ra by randomly changing direction and going into, into a tumble phase. This algae is doing something that is the very, very similar emergent behavior with a completely different set of, uh, of uh, kind of structures and, and um, molecular and biological circuit, circuitry behind uh, the same phenomenon. But we can also go towards food, and we're also, when we do that, we also have a different phenomenon for doing that. The, but the emergent behavior of going towards food is shared between uh, lots of different organisms. Anyway, so the algae is, is, a, is a much simpler object to study compared to uh, the, the human airways or the human brain. <coughs> and um, so you can hold this in the, in, in the laboratory, uh, do imaging. Um, and uh, so, uh, so a lot of work has been done um, on understanding both what's going on inside, so we have the ATP consumption, but also the synchrony between the cilia uh, on algae. This colored thing here is, is a section of, um, of a mammalian uh, airway tissue. There, there are cells that produce the mucus, which are labeled here. They're called goblet cells. And then uh, cells that have uh, cilia are, uh, are black here with the cilia in green. Uh, so, so, so you see that the whole, the whole surface is really uh, carpeted in, uh, in, in these cilia. Um, if we, if we just take a, a tissue of those cells and, and try to do microscopy, what we get is something which is gray and, and just fuzzy. And probably from far away, it, you can barely see that there's, uh, there's any kind of dynamics in this movie. Um, so here, cells are, say, the size from here to here. Each cell has uh, tens or even hundreds of, of motile cilia. And it's very, very hard to kind of imagine zooming in and, and seeing seeing nicely shapes of, of cilia or, or even individual uh, state of, uh, of phase locking, to understand phase locking. So, so, so one first challenge we had when, uh, when we wanted to understand uh, airways and, and the brain tissue, which is very similar to this, um, was, OK, how do we actually quantify the, the synchrony uh, between, uh, between cilia? And ca can we work out how that uh, gets lost when, when cilia are far away from each other? Um, So I'll come back to that. Uh, I'll, I'll also show you. So, so we started doing those biological experiments to, to, together with continuing with the optical trap experiments. So the optical trap experiments are, are, are now an evolution of what I showed you with the three spheres, the, with, the, with the micro pump. But now um, we, we need a way not, not to be assigning what each sphere should be doing, but to, leave, to make it into an oscillator and to leave the phase of the, this oscillator free. Because what we want to study is synchronization uh, between, uh, between oscillators. So in order to do that, you need some sort of feedback in, in the system. So, so the, first, um, uh, the first way in which we created um, 
uh, a free oscillator uh, was to to have a, a bead in a trap, um, put the trap a little bit sideways, say to the left of the bead. The bead would then go towards the point of focus, and then we kept analyzing the position of the bead. And when the bead reached the, the position of the beam, we moved the beam back to the right, and the bead uh, went back to the right. And when, when it reached the, the position of this new laser beam here, we switched this beam off and switched the beam back on at this position here. So if you do that, and this requires constant imaging of where the bead is and the ability to put the laser beam left and right, if you do that, you create uh, an oscillation that has a fixed uh, amplitude, but the phase is free. The, the, basically, the phase is only set by by, by where the bead is. So, so, so if there's no external forces and no noise, this will just be quite deterministic bead going left and right. But if you have thermal noise, this can randomize the phase. Uh, and if you have another object doing its own thing and putting a force onto this object, then that, then that can kind of uh, make the phase of this oscillation uh, anticipate or retard. So, so this, which we called geometric switch, is, is one nice way to, to set up a system that has a, has a free phase oscillator and to study then synchronization of more than one of these objects. So again, in our minds, this now represents cilia. <clears throat> so each, each bead is creating a fluid flow, which is quite similar to how a filament generates fluid. Uh, the, the frequency and the amplitude that we make these work at is, is fairly similar to the cilia um, uh, operation. And uh, kind of all the details of how a cilium can flex and, uh, and have different power recovery stroke, etc., cetera, are, are then represented by the details of how we, how, we, um, how we move the beads in the laser beam. And I'll just show you an example of what I mean by that in, in a second. So all of that, this I've already explained to you. OK, so, so what we did was set up, two, first of all, just a system of two of these oscillators. Um, and we, we studied them as a function of the distance. Uh, so here's zero distance, um, and here's 40 microns. And we created an order parameter just to tell us if these things are going in phase, or in antiphase, or random phase. So in this notation, minus one is, uh, is in phase, and uh, one is uh, antiphase. And uh, this heat map just basically gives us the distribution of what's happening once we let the system go and, and analyze uh, the, 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 this, this order parameter for, for synchronization. Basically, in, in our first experiments, which we published in, I think, 2009 or 10, <coughs> the, the beads were always going in antiphase. And uh, we could, we, we, they stayed in sync, sync um, uh, up to about 35 microns uh, away from each other. At that point, basically, thermal noise becomes stronger than, much stronger than the hydrodynamic forces that they feel. And, and the system just goes into, you see this histogram is spreading out. You can basically have any phase difference between the beads. So it's, it's a random, it's, there's no coupling anymore. Um, this is just a histogram of that same experiment. What was more interesting and, and linked nicely with what the cilia are doing was this experiment where, again, we had two beads. But instead of um, moving them in just harmonic traps, so I showed you the tweezer as being a harmonic well. Uh, but if, you're, if you scan your laser beam very fast, you can create, uh, out, of, out of the light of the lasers, you can create a, a potential landscape that can have any shape. It doesn't have to have a harmonic shape. It can also be flat, flat lines of potential, uh, which I've sketched here. Or even these lines can be curved the other way. So you can, you can basically you spend more time here with your laser beam than you spend here. And you do this super fast, much faster than the beads move about. And so, so for the beads, th this is an effective potential landscape that has this uh, funny shape. And then in these experiments, we were doing the same game of geometric switch. So we pushed the beads in one direction. They reached a boundary that we analyzed, and we just moved our harmonic system, our, our uh, laser light trap uh, to the left and then to the right again, switching. And the, synchron the synchronicity you see here is the antiphase that I showed you from the previous heat map 
when, when the potential is curved uh, up. But then if the potential is flat, there is no synchrony, even if the beads are close to each other. So these spend, do, they spend some time in phase, some time in, in antiphase. Uh, basically, the average is a random phase. There's no phase locking. And um, when the potential is curved down in this active driven way, then the, the synchronicity is in phase. OK, so, so this we, we then had some um, hand-waving way to, to understand this um, ba based on uh, first passage times and, um, and also the hydrodynamic modes um, of the Ozine tensor. But what's interesting biologically is that you can then, you, you can actually go and look at what, what the algae do. Okay, so we got this nice kind of transition as a function of the, of the curvature of the potential. But the, we, we could actually, for the first time, link with something biological based on those experiments. We, we took data, which came from a, a, an American group of uh, Bailey, <coughs> about the, the conformation so, so, so the detailed shape of the, of the uh, algae, the Chlaminomonas algae uh, cilia as they beat, and we just segmented that, that, uh, that filament uh, at each position in its beating cycle, worked out uh, how much force it was putting on the, onto the fluid, and then uh, represented, a, turned that into a sphere that moved into in a closed orbit, which is kind of this, this red uh, little bean here. Basically, the motion of this of a sphere along this orbit is is has been defined as having this as giving the same fluid flow as the sum of all the little cylinders uh, along this thing here. So you can think of a sphere moving along here as being the center of drag uh, of of this filament. So in the in the far field, the flow generated by the sphere will be the same as the flow generated by that uh, filament doing its complicated uh, motion. And then that thing, um, we can actually think of, it's now become a sphere moving just uh, left and right and, and up and down in, in an orbit. Uh, we can just re really represent it in terms of our simple models of how we're moving spheres with, with optical traps. And uh, so we have, from the optical traps, we have uh, a dimensionless way of, uh, of understanding the role of uh, thermal noise. So we, we have a number, which is the thermal noise divided by the amplitude of our motion and the force that we, we, we move things by. This is dimensionless, and it's a way of understanding uh, thermal noise versus the internal forces that the filament has. And then we can create this kind of curvature number uh, that in the experiments we, we can flip from, from positive to negative, and we can compare to, to biological, uh, to, to, to the effective curvature of what the cinema is doing in a biological context. OK, when, when we did that, then <clears throat> it turned out that um, we could explain breaststroke motion of, of the algae. Or at least, I mean, our, our simple model thinking is consistent with the fact that the algae goes in breaststroke most of the time. OK, in the very last minutes, I will just show you what we're doing now with the, with the real um, airway stuff. Um, so these are now videos from our lab. Um, Actually, the very first video in the first slide, I think, was, was not an airway, but it was a, a paramecium. So that, that's a single cell microorganism that swims in ponds again and has hundreds of filaments. These are actually human cells. <coughs> you can see kind of it's, it's complicated. And there's actually cell, uh, cilia in the background are doing something slightly different from the cilia in the foreground. Um, but this is what we have to work with. But what you can see is, is, is uh, Celia doing a very nice power recovery stroke in, in, in videos like this. OK, whether, you, whether you're looking at an algae or a human, these, these cilia have exactly the same biological structure, which means you can really, depending on the question, you can go and choose uh, to be investigating the, the simplest organism that exhibits the phenomenon you want to explain. Um, there's molecular motors. Um, OK, I'm not going to talk too much about how things go on inside. I'll just show you how we're doing uh, current experiments. So for, for airways, the cells need to, be, need to live uh, between kind of a, a medium that gives them nutrients that re represents blood and air. Uh, so, so people have devised um, a, a semi-permeable membrane that is a, uh, a represented schematically here as a line. 
the, the cell culture medium manages to get uh, under and through this membrane. Cells live here, and above here, there is a, a, a gas, gas vapor that has to be humid and has to have the right uh, percentage of CO2 for, for the cells to be happy. Um, so, so basically, you need some sort of gadgets to, to hold this nicely sterile and in place if you want to do experiments for, uh, for hours uh, of, of imaging. Um, so you have to kind of, so, so the, the well, okay, the, these, these wells are called air liquid interface culture wells. The, the biologists already have these, they're, they're commercial things um, because it's something um, medics do, if, if people have asthma or cystic fibrosis or a whole set of more rare diseases that involve cilia motion, uh, the analysis of uh, cilia motion is one of the assays that uh, doctors would do. So, so, so these wells to, to look at cells uh, exist. But, but gadgets to actually do proper experiments over a long time um, don't exist commercially and, and you, you have to build something to hold temperature and, and gas and, and image at the same time. So then you can do two experiments. You can, you can image uh, the whole tissue and you get those fuzzy videos that I showed you before. Or you can, you can take the membrane, bend it over and lo look sideways on. And that's how you get the, the, the videos of, um, um, of the power recovery stroke. Now these videos are of, of, uh, from the edge, but of, of uh, cells that come from uh, humans that have a genetic condition called primary cilia dyskinesia, and you can see that these cilia are just twitching, but they don't have the proper kind of beating pattern that leads to, to proper flow. So, so, so people with this genetic disorder are, are very ill, and uh, <coughs> one of the complications they have is uh, they, they don't properly move their mucus, but they have a whole lot of other problems as well, because this, the cilia motion is important in the brain too, to, to, to move nutrients around the brain. Cystic fibrosis is a much more common disease. Uh, again, it's genetic, but it, it affects the way mucus is produced, and mucus becomes too stiff. And uh, <coughs> patients with cystic fibrosis typically have a lot of problems uh, linked with infection because their, their muc mucociliary clearance is not working properly. So, so, so these things can be looked at in the lab. But in order to, to investigate synchronization, and this is the last thing I want to tell you today. What we really had to do was address how to quantify videos from, from taken from the top down. Because, because the, okay, so, so videos like this one, these are, are what doctors take. They, they, would, they scrape themselves from, from you, from the patient. They, they, they then look down and what they see is something like this. But it's, they can qualitatively tell you that this is twitching and it's not right. Um, but it, it's not very good for, for understanding things like synchronization, which is then itself important in, in, in the mucociliary clearance, which is actually the, 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 the property that needs to be working fine in, in a person. For that, what you really want is, is large scale enough uh, systems. But then if you're looking at the, at the whole tissue, you get a video which is complicated and looks like this. And it, it's almost impossible to think of segmenting and working out uh, motion of individual things in, in, in an image like this. So what we did in the last couple of years uh, has, been to, it has been to develop a technique called uh, DDM, um, which is a, a, an, an image uh, video, video uh, uh, analysis uh, method. And uh, the nutshell is that you have your video made of many images, and you first of all, you subtract every image with every other image. So you go from n images to n squared pairs uh, of subtracted images. You then average together the pairs, all the pairs that have the same uh, time interval. And th that way you go back. If you had n, image, n images, you now go back to a stack of n subtracted images because you have n different time delays in, in a video. So we're back to n. And then in those, uh, but, but now these are uh, kind of difference images. They, they come from having subtracted two frames. On that object, um, okay, if you just add all the pixels in an image difference uh, together, then if the time lag is zero, that means you, you are subtracting the image with itself, the addition of is zero because 
we just have subtracted the same frame. If, you're, if you've got a little time lag, you subtract and you add up everything, you will have some signal. If you take a bigger time lag, you subtract and you add up, you'll have a much bigger signal because things have moved about more in, in those two objects. But the signal doesn't grow to infinity. If you, once you've given enough time for the system to rearrange, then from that time onwards, if you make your time lag bigger uh, and you add the signal up, it's going to flatten out. So in general, if you take frame subtractions, you sum up and you plot, you're going to get a signal that grows and saturates. OK, what's clever about uh, this technique that was developed about 10 years ago <coughs> by colleagues is that if you, if, if you don't simply sum up every pixel, but you first Fourier transform, and then you work with the coefficients of the Fourier transform, you can basically see how the structure grows, for the time scale for a signal, which is structure, to grow uh, for each of the different Fourier modes. This basically tells you everything about um, kind of space and, and space scale and time scale in, in that movie. It tells you how quickly structure is, is rearranged uh, for, 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 uh, over each characteristic uh, scale. And it's equivalent to, to doing light scattering, but it's, it's much more direct and it doesn't need any, any equipment. You've basically just made a video. So it's been exploited now by us and by others in microscopy, but it's also a technique that could be used uh, to, to analyze images uh, from, from cameras, say imaging uh, ant colonies or, or people moving about in crowds, etc. And that, that's all stuff that hasn't been done. Anyway, so there's nothing special about microscopy, is what I'm telling you. But in microscopy, it's very powerful because it gets away from trying to segment um, and identifying objects, and still it tells you um, the average of how th things are moving about. So for, for the cilia, the cilia kind of beats, so th they go back on themselves. So this is a quite special situation, and what we get is oscillating signals as a function of the lag time. This, this is because the cilia have a beating frequency, and they come back. So by doing this analysis and plotting signal versus time lag, we get the, the beating frequency of the cilia. But we also get this decay here. Uh, and the decay time of that oscillation comes from, com, comes from two things. One is that the cilia are not perfect oscillators, so they lose coherence. And the second is that over a field of view such as uh, something like this with many, many cells, uh, a cell here is not going to have exactly the same frequency as a cell somewhere else. So, so when I image together uh, everything and do Fourier transform, I'll get, um, I'll get a decaying signal from, from the averaging of the frequencies. If, if I do the analysis on windows, so not just the whole frame of view, but, but kind of tiles, uh, I can actually work out the scale at which things synchronize with each other by, by looking at um, how that decay time scales with a tile area. So if I make my tile small enough, I do go into a tile which is coherent with itself. And if I make the window bigger, I'm averaging over things that are incoherent. So with no user input, so there was no segmentation, no, no thresholding, nothing of nothing, just Fourier transforms, I've looked at a very noisy video of things that are barely visible, and I've calculated something complicated, which is the, the scale uh, over which these cilia are, are synchronized with each other. I think I've kind of run out of time, so I won't tell you very much. So, so there, there is very interesting information that you can get if you have the patience to segment cilia. You can actually work out how each cilium is beating, uh, but that's almost uh, another topic. What, what I, okay, so some of you may have been interested in this, and you're very welcome to ask questions now or, or come and talk to me over the whole week about this. Well, the one thing I did want to go back to was also some of you may just be wondering, OK, you've heard that biology poses interesting questions and just wondering how to attack a problem, how to find something tractable there. I think that's also another very interesting thing to talk about. And there could be questions now. And also, we're going to have some sessions, an open mic session and uh, various other occasions to, to, to talk collectively uh, during this week. So, so you can also think about this sort of question for, for those, uh, those moments when, when we will be discussing. Uh, thank you very much.